Good morning. It's good to be with you. I'm Pastor Scott. Uh, hi, Linda. <laughs> it's a wonderful day, and I, so I was telling the people in the first service, I enjoy being in a place that has four distinct seasons, but I'm just wondering how many of you choose this one over, say, January and February? Uh, yeah, quite a few of you. Okay. Well, uh, let me start us off today by reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. One of the ministries that we have here at First Alliance is a ministry that helps people who have found themselves trapped in some kind of sexual sin, whether it's viewing things online or whatever it is, and even those who may be in a relationship with somebody who is dealing with that. And so I want us to uh, view a God at Work testimony video of two people in our church that found themselves in that and how they have worked their way out of it. I had a secret life that I hid from Cassie, and then I had my life with Cassie that people didn't see. If this had been a couple years earlier, I would have been livid. I would have picked up the kids. I would have left. Like, I I was a, you don't do this. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. If you do this, I'm gone. But that night, there can only be, it can only be described as having the Holy Spirit coming over me because all I wanted to do was give him grace and to hold him and to tell him it was going to be okay and to forgive him. I wouldn't ask for it, but the Holy Spirit was working in my heart. And all of this shame and regret and the fear of trying to live 70 more years hiding these secrets ended up resulting in me going to Cassie and confessing everything to her. He confessed about all the sexual sin that he had been struggling with through our entire marriage. We, we know now how this can only be overcome through community. Mm -hmm. It's it's just going to keep growing if we keep it secret. So we want you to know that there is hope. There is hope for those that struggle and there is hope for those that have been betrayed. It may not be easy to overcome and it may not be easy to rebuild that relationship and that trust, but it can be done. With a lot of hard work and coming alongside a community and learning the tools that it takes to overcome these sexual struggles, you can break free and you can have a marriage that frankly is, is better than you can ever imagine. As Kenny said, uh, this can be achieved, but it's not just by trying harder. Anybody who has found themselves struggling with this realizes that just trying harder doesn't do it. Uh, you need help, you need, need to be in community, and we provide that uh, through something called Sexual Integrity 101. It begins on Monday, August the 23rd at 7 o'clock. And if you are interested in that, um, first of all, there is more to this video. If you go and check on that uh, address, it's on the screen. You can watch the full video of that testimony. And if you have questions, uh, you can send them by email to Kenny, and it would just be his first and middle initial, C. In, and then his last name is it's written up there on the screen at gmail.com. Let's start with prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that this is a place of healing, uh, that it's not a place where we have to hide the things that we struggle with, and that there are people that are ready to help. Father, we thank you most of all that your Holy Spirit is the one that provides the power in order to find uh, a way out of the things that have kept us down for so long. This morning, Father, we praise you and we worship you as the God who delivered us from all that held us down. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together and worship our Lord through song. Praise treasures of faith. 
never enough and you came along and put me back together and every desire is now satisfied
here I lay at your feet I sing through the night oh God the battle belongs to you
the pavement, his life was the cause. We stood neath the dead we could never Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your mercy. There's more than we will ever comprehend or understand, Father, and thank you. Thank you for laying that battle down before us, that you've already fought and won. Whatever we're struggling with this morning, whatever we're dealing with, no matter how long or how short, Father, you have taken care of it for us. Thank you, Father. We give you everything we have this morning, and in your name we pray. Amen. Good morning to you. Uh, I invite you to join me in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, where I'll read from verses 18 through 21. Uh, I'd love you to open there with me so that uh, you can follow along with me as we read and study this together. If you're uh, visiting with us today or we have not had the opportunity to meet yet, my name is Mike Kazarowski. Uh, I serve as the lead pastor here, and it would be a great privilege uh, to meet you after service if you have a few minutes to spare. Uh, the invitation is open to you. Please don't hesitate to uh, make yourself known. Um, for now, though, let's turn our ears attentively to God's voice as we read his word. Uh, once again, we'll read from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, verses 18 through 21. This is what Paul writes. All of this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Would you pray with me? Father, we commit this time to you and ask that your spirit would engage our minds and transform our hearts as we examine this text this morning. We confess that these words are uh, more than just words, that they are breathed out by you. While they were written by human hands, we believe that you inspired these words and that they are your own words. Yet, Father, we need your help and assistance in discerning your voice. And so as you inspired these words, would you now illuminate them to us so that we may see the glory of your ways and the glory of your character and nature. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you had to choose one word, one word that summarizes the end result of the gospel, the end result of the good news of, of Jesus, if all you had was one word uh, to describe the goal and objective of all of Christ's work, uh, a good word to use would be the word reconciliation. Reconciliation. Uh, a reminder that in context of the whole book of 2 Corinthians, 
Paul was the founder of this church in Corinth, but as time went by, the Corinthian church was influenced by others outside of the church after Paul had left the city. And so, so Paul here is writing to the Corinthians to reestablish his apostolic authority as a messenger of God, as an ambassador of Christ. And he's also writing to reestablish his message, the message of the gospel in which the church was founded upon. And if you were here with us last week, we uh, took a look at this text together, and you'll remember that the focus of this passage as a whole, specifically from verses 11 through the end of the chapter 21, the, the, the focus of this passage was Paul's ministry, but the focus of Paul's ministry is the gospel, and the focus of the gospel is reconciliation. That's the end goal of the gospel is reconciliation. Uh, this is what we will look at this week as we finish the chapter, recognizing uh, that the focus of the gospel uh, in these final verses is reconciliation. The word reconciliation in this passage, in a literal sense, means to exchange. The word was actually most commonly used in this time to describe the exchange actually of currency. The, the, the process of changing money from one kind of currency to a different kind of currency. Paul, however, doesn't use the word in a literal sense, uh, but rather a metaphorical sense. Paul isn't speaking to the literal exchange of money. Instead, he writes about the metaphorical change, exchange of a relationship. The, the process of exchanging one kind of relationship for another kind of relationship. That's what true reconciliation is. Right? Reconciliation takes a relationship that is marked by hostility and anger and enmity, and it exchanges it for another kind of relationship. It trades it with a new relationship that is marked by peace and love and friendship. The visual picture we have, it's, it's, a, it's a clenched, raised fist in a fit of rage exchanged for open arms of welcome, embrace, and peace. And in order to understand how reconciliation plays into our relationship with God, we have to go back to the beginning. In the beginning, God created mankind in his image, in his likeness, male and female, he created them. And then he blessed them and he gave them free reign and dominion over the earth and gave them the freedom to enjoy the, his many blessings and his many gifts. Uh, but that wasn't enough for them. God instructed them not to eat from one specific tree and they did it anyway. And why did they do it? Was it because they were merely just hungry and it was the closest fruit to them? No. They did it because they saw that the fruit was delightful, right? that, that, it was, that it was good for food, that it looked like it tasted really good, but even more so, they thought that eating this particular fruit would make them wise. It would enlighten them, if you will, to something that God knew. Because remember, the serpent had just told Adam and Eve, that God knows, God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. That's a direct quote from the serpent from Genesis. And so Adam and Eve, they saw the fruit and they said, God is withholding something from us. God is hiding something from us. We want to be like God. We want to know what God knows since he's not telling us. They saw something they wanted, and out of their own selfish ambition, they took it. They sinned willfully against God. It's not as if they were somehow duped. No, they willfully, under their own volition, challenged God's kingship in that moment and tried to take the throne for themselves. 
Once again, this was not some sort of minor misunderstanding. This was a blatant act of willful cosmic rebellion. This was a coup against the throne of God. And with this attempted seizure of power, as one commentator wrote, Adam and Eve plummeted. They plummeted from the pinnacle of innocence and intimacy into the pit of guilt and estrangement. And they brought down the entire human race with them. You see, here we are thousands of years later being descendants of Adam. We are a cursed people. Our DNA is laced with sin. From the moment of conception where life begins, we are tainted with a propensity to sin. That's Psalm 51.5. That's what, that's what David writes. He writes, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. D David's saying that there was no sinful act that made me a sinner. I've always been a sinner. Since before I was even born, I was a sinner. Since I, the moment I was uh, conceived, the moment I came into existence, I was a sinner. David says, don't let the babies in the nursery fool you. <laughs> right? They're cute and they're adorable, but they are also sinners by nature. You'll probably think I'm a horrible dad when my little one, when my, my, my children were young, I used to hold them in my arms as infants and say, oh, you are such an adorable little sinner. <laughs> what, a, what a cute little sinner. What a shame. <laughs> you don't have to teach them how to misbehave and lie. They're going to figure it out all on their own. Why? Because they have a sinful disposition. Once again, it's in their very nature. The actual sinful acts that we observe are merely expressions of what is written on our hearts at the moment we came into existence. This concept about sin originating with Adam and then being passed down from generation to generation, there's a theological phrase that we call original sin. This is what we call original sin. And as a part of original sin, we not only inherit a sinful nature, but we also inherit a guilty verdict. That's Romans 5.12 where Paul writes, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. So before we fully come to understand the gospel and fully understand Jesus and his work, I must come to the conclusion that in my sin, in my original, natural state, I am at war with God. I am not at peace with him because I am a sinner. I do not have peace with God because I am against him. Just as Adam and Eve saw the throne of God and tried to seize it, I am an active and willful agent of rebellion. And as a result, my relationship with God is fractured. Now, with any broken relationship in life, what is required to mend the brokenness is one of the two people at war with each other within the relationship to take initiative. If you are estranged from your spouse or estranged from your children or estranged from a friend or your parents, restoration will not occur until you or the other person reaches across the aisle and says, hey, I'd like to talk about this. Can we please try and hash this out? Unless someone takes initiative, relationships will remain broken. Alienation from one another will inevitably remain. And Paul, here in our text that we read this morning, makes it crystal clear in verse 18, that God is the one who initiates reconciliation with us. Paul begins the passage by saying that all of this, all of this is from God. It's not as if we were somehow uh, wishing for God or wishing to make things right. God is the one who, who, who wanted to make things right. 
and took initiative. All of this is from God, and the, the all this that he is referring to is what happens in verse 17. If you were to take a look, what we looked at last week, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. The, the, the process of transformation for those who are in Christ originates with God. And these verses explain how it was possible for the old to pass away in the new to come. And it starts not with us, but with God. Newness is made possible because God took initiative. He came to us. He took the first step. And we'll notice in this passage that here that not only did the process of reconciliation begin with God, but it also ends with God. But Paul is very careful with his words here when he writes that God reconciled us to himself. That in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. He took action to exchange our relationship of hostility toward him with a relationship of peace with him. Once again, in ordinary relationships, either side can initiate the process of reconciliation, yet both parties must eventually be reconciled to each other. But between God and us, God and humanity, reconciliation always begins with God, and it always reconciles us to himself. Why? Why this choice of words? Because there is no need for God to be reconciled to humanity. We are the guilty party. We are the alien, the the, the alienated ones. In the garden, it was not God who turned his back on humanity. It was humanity that turned their back to God. God never moved. God never separated himself uh, from us. They separated from him. So humanity needs to be reconciled to God. And God is the only one who can accomplish such a task. So I want you to notice how God-centric this process of reconciliation is. God is both the beginning and the end of reconciliation. He is the beginning and the end of this exchange that occurs. He is both the initiator and the object that we are reconciled to. And it is his unassisted work that paves the way for us. Yet how many times in our own journey, even after becoming believers, that we convince ourselves that I need to take action, that I need to do something, that I need to be a good person, that I need to read my Bible, that I need to pray more, that I need to come to church more so that I may be right with God, so that God would somehow, uh, I would earn his favor, that he, that he would be pleased with me. That, that is not the reason why we do those things, is to, to, to earn his favor, to merit uh, our own right standing with God because God has already taken the initiative to make us right with him. He's already accomplished that. He has reconciled us to him. As one commentator puts it, the gospel does not call on us to do something for God that he might save us. It merely announces what God has done to save us so that we might trust him. I'm reminded of a quote from Jonathan Edwards that I've shared in the recent past. I can't remember, but it fits in well here where where Edwards says you contribute nothing to your salvation except for the sin that made it necessary. It's our only contribution. This concept is a dramatic shift in history's understanding of God. Because every other religion or worldview will try to explain what we need to do to get to God. What are the steps? What are the rungs on the ladder that we need to climb in order to get to God? How do we need to contribute? Whereas Christianity says it's not what we need to do to get to God, but rather what God has already done to get to us. People throughout all of history have participated in ridiculous practices, all in ignorant hope to somehow appease God. And God says, I've already done everything necessary to reconcile you to me. You don't have to do anything. I've done it for you. Would you just accept that? 
And so clearly, reconciliation is not something we do, but something that God has accomplished. Therefore, Paul's ministry of reconciliation that's been given to him is not telling people to make peace with God, but telling them that God has already made peace with the world, with them. And this is why Paul's ministry and all true biblical ministry is primarily one of proclamation, of telling the world that God has crossed the great divide to bring us back into the fold. And anything less than a proclamation of what God has done falls short of what God intends us to do. You'll notice in verse 19 that God does not entrust to Paul any sort of equipment or tools or strategy or blueprint for success. No, God entrusts to Paul a message, specifically the message of reconciliation. He's saying, Paul, go out in the world. You're going you're gonna to get beat. You're going to be imprisoned. You're going to be put on death's row. You're going to be abandoned. All of your friends are going to leave you. But I have one goal for you, and that is for you to proclaim this message. That is your success, Paul, is to proclaim this message. And that is what I am asking you to do. You see, we can do a lot of wonderful good things in this world. But our end goal should always be to proclaim this message. That is Paul's primary responsibility. Our job is not to bring about reconciliation, but to just announce it. To announce that reconciliation has already happened, that the work of reconciliation is finished. That God has removed all of the barriers and obstacles of fellowship with him. Right? The, the, the sin that was keeping us from God, that, that served as a barrier, he, God has handled it. God has dealt with the source of enmity. That is our message. Reconciliation is an accomplished fact. Yet, it still must be embraced and, and, and accepted. There's, there's an oddity in here that the barrier is removed. The work is finished. That's what Jesus said from the cross. It is finished. Yet, the process is incomplete. Despite the fact that there is nothing now standing in between us and God anymore, there are still some who stand in opposition to him that are still at war with him. And so God, in his loving mercy, makes his appeal to such people, calling out to them, and he does it through us, as Paul writes. Having been entrusted with this message of reconciliation, Paul assumes the role of an ambassador for Christ. This is a pretty bold analogy when you consider the function of an ambassador. The, 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 the ambassador functions as a representative of a ruling authority. And so when an ambassador spoke, it was as if the ruling authority was speaking. And if you disrespected or insulted the ambassador, it was akin to disrespecting or insulting the one who sent the ambassador. Now, while the ambassador carried an immense amount of authority, it must be noted that an ambassador did not speak in his own name or act under his own authority, but on the authority of the one who sent him. And the message that the ambassador carried did not originate with him, but originated from the one who sent him. And the ambassador did not have the authority to alter or change the message. And so Paul, as an ambassador, a delegated representative of Christ, not even just figuratively, but literally, a, a, a delegated representative of Christ, goes to the lost world who stands in opposition with God and says, your kingdom has been at war with God's kingdom since the dawn of humanity, yet God is offering you a peace treaty. And so we implore you, we urge you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. The peace treaty is on the table. Would you please receive it? 
Would you receive this offer of God's peace? And as one picks up the peace treaty, they say, that's great news, but how is this so? What happened? What happened that God would offer us peace when we were his enemy? How did God remove the barrier between us and him? And they read through the conditions of the peace treaty and shockingly find that the requirement for peace, a requirement for reconciliation between us and God was actually satisfied in the person of Jesus. And we come to verse 21 and find one of the most richest and most profound statements of the gospel that we could read. How is reconciliation possible? How was it achieved? How were the barriers removed so that this exchange and relationship could be made possible? The answer is in verse 21. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In being a descendant of Adam, in our own sin, we are indebted to God. We owe him something. We have trespassed against him, and for that, we must pay the price. And God has made it very clear that that price for our sin, the, 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 the sin nature is death. Yet earlier in the passage, Paul writes in verse 19 that God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. The world, humankind, accumulated a mountain of debt toward God in their sin, yet he did not hold them to those debts. He did not hold those trespasses against them. We were dead in the water with no way out, and God would have every right in his godly kingship to hold us accountable for what we owed him, yet he did not hold his trespasses against us. Now, once again, Paul is very careful with his words. Notice what that verse doesn't say. It does not say that God forgot about the debt. It does not say that God erased or just deleted the record. It does not say that God decided that the outstanding debt just didn't really matter anymore, and so there's no need to repay it. No, the debt still stood because sin has to be punished. God would cease to be God if he didn't punish sin. And so yes, God is a God of love, but he is also a God of perfect justice. So the debt has to be paid. And if the debt is not paid, if sin is not punished, then it would be the most outrageous and shocking act of injustice that the world has ever seen. If, if, you, if your stomach churns when the most hardened criminals walk away free, unpunished, if you just lose your mind over the vast injustices of the world, which you should, let me tell you that all of those injustices all of the ones that we observe of the world pale in comparison to the injustice that occurs if a single sin goes without its proper punishment of death. That is how significantly awful our sin is. You see, we have a somewhat warped idea about punishments that fit the crime. The only punishment that fits the crime of any sin according to God and his perfect character is death. And God would not be a God worth worshiping if he lets any sin go unpaid and unpunished. With that in mind, consider what verse 19 does say. Verse 19 merely says that God in reconciliation did not count the world's trespasses against them but you don't have to go too far down the page 
to find out that he did count the world's trespasses against somebody, somebody else. There was a substitute in our place. And this is how God is able to not count our trespasses against us without compromising his own integrity and justice. Once again, verse 21, for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin. On our behalf, for our sake, God made Jesus Christ to be sin. Meaning that at the cross, God regarded Jesus like he would regard a sinner. God's wrath, God's just punishment for sin was poured out on his own son. If as a child you ever played with a magnifying glass, you know that you could hold it under the powerful rays of the sun and the concentrated light through the magnifying glass would form a little white mark and you could take that white spot and you could focus it on a, on a leaf which would then begin to burn. In the same way, our sins were put on Christ at the cross and he suffered a concentrated, fiery wrath from God. I mean, let's not be coy here. At the cross, Jesus was clothed with all of the murder and hatred, all of our lusts and impurities, all of the jealousy, all of the pride, all of our deceit, all of our brokenness, all of our abandonment, and all of our illness. All that is heinous in this world was focused on Christ as he writhed in pain on the cross. And he did it willingly for our sake. To go back to the debt analogy, it's as if you have a, a, a mountain of debt that you couldn't hope to pay back in a million years, even though you tried to pay it back in vain. And then you go to the bank one day and they pull up your account and they inform you that you no longer owe them anything. And this isn't due to an accounting error. It isn't because they erased your debt or just decided we have enough money. There, there, there is no need for a repayment. No, your balance stood at zero. Because did you know that somebody else came in who had infinite wealth, who didn't have a debt of his own, he has paid it back for you. Jesus not only willingly paid the debt, but he was the only one who could. He made him to be sin who knew no sin. Jesus had no personal acquaintance with sin. He did not experience sin. He did not uh, sin in thought or in action. And if he did have sin, then he couldn't have paid our debt because he had his own debt to pay. No, he is the only one being the sinless God-man that can fully satisfy God's wrath. And he was willing to do it. Why? It's the second part of verse 21. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. There is a great exchange that occurs at the cross. A trading of places, if you will. Jesus took up our place in the eyes of God at the cross so that we could take up Jesus' place in the eyes of God. Our debt, just as our debt is credited to Christ, Christ's perfect, spotless righteousness was credited to us. Christ became something that he wasn't, sin, so that we could become something that we aren't, righteous. So when we accept God's peace treaty under the conditions and circumstances of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. God no longer sees us in our sin, not the sins that we've committed in the past. He doesn't see us in the sins that we'll commit today in the present, nor will he see us in our sins that we're, we're just inevitably going to commit in the future in this life. Instead, he sees us in the perfection of Jesus. 
And so can you this morning in good conscience say that you have accepted God's offer of peace and salvation under such conditions? Do you understand that salvation is not merely a state of mind or a feeling, but it was a great act of accomplishment of God and an act of God's deliverance through the work of Jesus? If you haven't, I implore you, be reconciled to God. Accept what God has already done for you on your behalf in Jesus. Would you pray with me? And Lord, we know that your word is good and that your word is perfect. And I thank you, Father, Um, that while we were dead to rights, you provided a way out. Father, in your mercy and in your love, you saw us alienated from you, far off, blinded, uh, and you paved a way, Lord. And you paved a way not for us to get to you, uh, but for you to get to us and rescue us, Lord. I pray, Lord, that those who in this room this morning still stand in opposition to you, we'll see the great lengths that you have gone to to, to reach out to them, and to, to take them up and to hold them, Lord. Would they not deny your offer of peace? We pray, Father, that your spirit would move about this place and we would glorify you as we uh, proclaim this message to the lost world. And in your holy name I pray, amen. Let's go ahead and sing one more song together. Would you please stand with us as we sing together? Don't you see the dawn of the darkest day? Christ on the road to Calvary. Drive by sinful man, torn and beaten then, nailed to a cross of wood. This the power of the cross.
you're here with us this morning and uh, something that was said or sung or talked about uh, is, is just rattling in your mind and you have questions and you need answers and you'd like to talk about what it means to be reconciled to God through Jesus, please, uh, the invitation is open to you to come make yourself known and talk with us. We always have elders, which are our leadership here at FAC, available to talk and pray and answer any questions that you might have. I'm available. I would love before you leave today to talk with you if this is where you're at and, and wondering um, what Jesus has done for you. Uh, please take us up on that offer. Um, we turn again to God's word of benediction from the book of Jude as we close our time. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace. God bless you guys.